I'm talking with the filmmakers behind Netflix's fantastic new documentary, Mucho Mucho Amor, uh, which follows the wild life of Puerto Rican astrologer Walter Mercado, uh, who enraptured audiences all over the world before suddenly disappearing from the spotlight. Um, here with me today are co-directors uh, Christina Constantini uh, and Kareem Tabj and uh, producer Alex Romero. So uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for talking with me. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us, Ian. All right. Um, I feel like I missed the Walter Mercado phenomenon uh, twice in my lifetime, uh, both during his heyday and in the sort of meme resurgence he had toward the end of his life. Um, that shouldn't be a surprise because I'm, I'm a square through and through. But uh, Alex, I understand you were instrumental in putting all of this together. And I wonder if you could talk to me about um, you know, your experience uh, or did you grow up watching uh, Walter Mercado? And when you approached uh, Christina and Kareem about the project, what was their reaction? Were they fans too? Or how did this all come together? Yeah, I mean, I grew up I grew up uh, like a lot of Latino kids, your grandparents are sort of adjacent parents, right? And so like, I would just get dropped off at their house all the time. And, uh, at, my, and at 5.45 p.m. every day, my grandma would like shush everyone in the house, me especially, and like this wizard would come on TV and tell her the future. Um, and I was mesmerized, you know, I didn't know what to sort of think about him. And, and the, actually, I mean, the truth is, uh, I was introduced to Kareem through a mutual friend and it was like one of the first things we talked about. I mean, it was like so obvious that we would both love Walter just, you know, having, uh, having been like a Latino kid of that era. And, uh, and he was going to Walter's estate sale in Miami, which I had heard reported about. And I was like, oh my God, are you, are you going? Like, are you gonna buy a cape, you know? And I said, man, I would love to do a documentary about that guy. Uh, and Kareem said, well, yeah, I mean, I'm going to buy a cape, but that's also why I'm going. <laughs> I'm trying to meet someone from the family. And when he made contact with them, we set a time to talk about it, uh, to potentially work on something together. And that same day, Christina called me and said, hey, uh, I'm obsessed with Walter Mercado. And I heard you're obsessed with Walter Mercado. Also, I want to make a documentary about him. And I was like, this is very weird because... I, I think I'm already making one. And in half an hour, I have my first call about it with this guy, Kareem. Uh, but maybe we could all work on it together, you know? Um, and it was just kind of a hunch. And I, to their credit, like they got on the phone together and had two kind of like uh, different skill sets, but that kind of the same universal point of view on the movie, which we all shared. Um, and it just it kind of uh, came together cosmically, I guess. Which is beautifully thematically appropriate, I would say. Um, let me ask you about that, because he was such a, a popular figure, even though I hadn't heard about him, but we've established why. Um, I, it surprises me that other people hadn't tried to tell his story, uh, or maybe they had. A, were you aware of people who also wanted to do a film like this, or maybe there have been other attempts besides just kind of like news pieces over the decades? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And that's something the three of us felt very strongly when we started this. We were like, why has this never been done? He is the most colorful person, per personality maybe ever on television. He has a, a, a very interesting life and he disappeared. It's like the perfect premise for a, a, a documentary in our view. Um, and I think one of the reasons is because there are just not that many Latinos in positions of of power, first of all, to commission this kind of stuff. I think in order to know the importance of this figure, you have to understand what he means to a Latino community. And that's, that's we've had to pitch that for the last two years. It's not the easiest pitch in the world. And then there are not that many Latino filmmakers who have access to funds to do a, a big documentary. So um, we, the three of us are constantly just amazed that this hadn't been done earlier. And it was really a great privilege to, to do the film. But I, I think it goes, goes back to this representation issue. If there were people in the boardrooms uh, who, who grew up like us with uh, Latino family members, I think it would have been made years and years and years ago. And we're just lucky that we got to make it, uh, you know, it was really the last time we ever could have made this film. You know, he passed away um, very recently. And so if it had been a year longer, this film wouldn't exist. Yeah. Um, Kareem, uh, can you talk to me about, uh, about your experience uh, in, in coming together on, on the film? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, as we talk about the film, we realize that we as filmmakers had the same experience that kind of Latino kids growing up throughout the States. So he's such a daily presence in our, uh, in our TV sets and in our family home. He was an extension of the family. I think to a certain extent, we took that for granted. We almost, he felt like he lived in this little box and that, and that he lived, you know, seven blocks away from us in the most fabulous house ever. Like, I, I don't think that we knew kind of, uh, we knew he was grand and he had his natural grandeur. I don't think we knew how big his appeal was and how far uh, his reach was. Um, but for all of us, having seen him as, a, you can imagine seeing had this character as a kid on the television, you're just like, what is this? And then after decades, he disappeared. So we almost all entered into, uh, I, I think individually, kind of like the desire to make a film also stemmed from like, whatever happened to Walter Mercado? Where did he go? He was like ubiquitous in our culture, on the media, and then all of a sudden he dis disappeared from one day to the next, uh, from one day to the next. So part of a, our, our, our desire in making the film was kind of solving the mystery of what did happen? Where was he? Was he still as fabulous? Was uh, you know, he still sharing this kind of uh, message? Uh, so that was really at the crux of what we wanted to do. And, and in our film, as you'll see, um, it's not a it's not a whodunit. It's not a discovery. You see Walter from the very beginning, and we go down and find him in his home in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, which is this visually uh, surreal, chock full of everything. Uh, we always ask Walter jokingly. We said, "Are you you minimalist?" He said, "No, I'm a maximalist." <laughs> and if you see his house, you can understand it. And the house is a it's a character in the film. Um, so we're really excited because this is a childhood icon. You know, we describe him for those folks like you who didn't grow up with him. Uh, he's, you know, one part Mr. Roger, one part Oprah dressed as Liberace. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, we've had this great pleasure as Latinos and this great privilege of having him as part of our culture and our home and our family, really, for, uh, for generations, for decades. And so the other part and desire of making this film was kind of sharing Walter with the world at large. And, and that's why we're so excited about our, our Netflix launch on July uh, 8th. It's because now everybody gets to have a bit of Walter in their life. I think well, he's a little big bird too. <laughs> he's a little big bird. <laughs> Very big, larger than life bird, I think. Um, so actually it's crazy listening to you all talk about Walter because it directly mirrors Lin-Manuel Miranda's experience as we see it uh, in the film. He shows up later to talk kind of fanboy out over Walter and get to meet him. But he had the same experience, uh, you know, the afternoon, you know, being shushed by, by I think it was his grandmother or somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and also just that, that reverence, that unbelievable meeting of an icon. It's, it's beyond celebrity. It's like meeting, you know, Walter is referred to as sort of a godly or a Christ-like figure at various points. Uh, yeah. So that's, that's just very cool. And I do want to talk about that house. Um, it, there was a lot of portraiture and the capes and these giant magnificent flamboyant displays all over the place. And at first, again, not having understood Walter watching the documentary or starting it, I was like, is this guy a narcissist? Like, what is going on here? <laughs> but by the end, I wondered if it was more just kind of a, um, a motivation for him as a reminder to what he does and the, the love that he kind of shared with the world and the appreciation coming back to him as a motivation to keep going and to stay positive. Uh, he's a very positive person, at least portrayed in the documentary. A couple of questions here. In getting to know him and filming and having that access, was he that genuinely a positive person? Was there stuff that you needed to perhaps take out due to some sensitivities? Um, and also just what was it like filming in that house? Were you in constant fear of knocking something over or <laughs> was, it, was it more controlled than that? One of, us, <laughs> one of us did knock something over. One of us. And one one of us. Of us. We don't know who, we'll never remember. It was me um, and <laughs> it was like a Grecian vase and I felt so bad and he would never let me live it down. I think what you don't, 
Pepsi in the dark because he had like an amazing sense of humor. And every time we would start filming, he'd, he'd go, oh, but my Grecian vase, what was it called again? Like, it had a very specific kind of, of name. Oh, yeah, I can remember now. Uh -huh. In the top of the mountains and outside of Athens. Anyway, yes, his, his house is amazing. Yes, he was a narcissist, but he was a narcissist in a way I've never seen before, which is he loved himself deeply, but he also loved everybody else deeply and so it was uh it, it's like hard to it was hard to find annoying it was so charming how much he loved himself um uh but yes he was truly one of the kindest people i've ever met in my entire life he his kareem always says so well he he would use all of his energy to make every sure everybody else in the room was feeling good and was happy and he would do everything for everybody else so you know he was truly one of the most uh, lovely love filled people i've ever met in my entire life so he, he was the person that you would want him to be um when we were kids so it was that was incredible and i can't remember the other parts of your question but i'm sure kareem and alex <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, I would say that the house is uh, is interesting because the house is exactly what you expect it to be. Uh, honestly, like, uh, you know, there's a shot in the film where uh, there's a drone shot where we kind of come into his house in the very beginning. And it's like, if you drove around the neighborhood, you'd say, that house is where Walter Mercado lives. And you do yes. it. <laughs> Even from the outside, it's the house. Uh, and then you walk in and it was like one part, like your great grandmother's house uh, and mostly your great grandmother's house if she was a wizard. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's magical in who the also, sense- Who also runs an ashram. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> who also runs an ashram. So every part of that house, generally speaking, looked like that. Um, and it was a sensory overload. We were, you know, we were filming for over, I guess, over two years with him. And every time we'd go, we would notice something new. And it wasn't that more things came in. It was just that there's chock full of mementos. Um, we would, uh, in passing, refer to it as either the the mausoleum because everything felt like it was a hundred years old, or the museum because it felt like this, you know, testament to his uh, his glory and past. Uh, it's really interesting that you say, was it a constant reminder? You know, we talk about how Walter really kind of had to invent himself, this fabulous person, and he says it. Um, and I think that there is something to that. He, he certainly had a, a very strong sense of self, uh, and he's very proud of everything he did. Um, but, uh, yeah, he was, also, he was absolutely also, like Christina said, he's a narcissist. The, the world was outwardly loving narcissist. He loved himself, but he always made you feel like he loved you more than he loved himself. Mm -hmm. So the house really became an interesting character because of that. It was such an interesting metaphor for who Walter's complicated and layered personality. Well, and his interactions with it, I think also watching him, like when we first got there, he pointed at a, not a portrait of himself, but like a kind of Renaissance style portrait and he was like and this is an original Raphael and then he just moved on and we we're like wait it's in I forgot about that Italian what and then and then like I like we couldn't let it go so like a few hours later we we're like Walter that that painting there is a Raphael and he goes, yes, it's from the period of Raphael. <laughs> so then there was like this add-on, you know, which is still incredible. Like if he has a painting from the period of Raphael. And then like the third time we were asked, we were like, that painting is from the period of Raphael? And he, he said, well, I found it on the street in New York City. And <laughs> then I took it to a friend of mine who knows a lot about this. And he said, it's almost definitely probably from the That's period right. of Raphael, right. you know, so like there's this, there's just this like big Sorry. fish kind of nature to him where yeah. it's like, you don't care if he's lying to you because no. his, or that you don't care about like the image he's portraying or the stories he's telling about it because they're so entertaining that you're just like, like, tell me more, you know? <laughs> Another story like that is when he told us he'd, he'd won many Oscars and we were like, wow, really? You've won many Oscars? 
And he's like, yes, let, let me show you. And we go into his like awards closet, which is really grand. And he's like, the Puerto Rican Oscar, the Jose, whatever it's called. And like totally different award. But, <laughs> but in this one, it is a Puerto Rican version of an Oscar. And therefore it was an Oscar. And, and like Alex said, yeah, who cares what the real story is? Because the Oscar is more fun. Yeah. <laughs> like, let's just let it be an Oscar. Um, one thing, uh, one one of the parts of my question, uh, and I think it, the the movie answered it, and you've answered it as well. Uh, just sort of the the candidness of Walter in the in the interviews, getting to know if was there anything that you needed to excise. One of the really cool parts of the documentary is addressing the issue of Walter's sexuality. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, kind of a montage of talk shows and appearances he did where there'd be people imitating him and they'd really play up the capes and the whole idea that he was gay. But then when he was directly confronted with the question, he kind of stood his ground like I'm, you know, I'm a private person and that doesn't really matter. Just as a personality, he seemed to transcend <laughs> sexuality. Um, I just wonder, were you aware of all of this before talking to him kind of coming into his life did you do your research in that regard or were there any kind of minefields where you asked maybe some questions that might seem inappropriate just kind of innocently i don't know if uh we did, I, I think that to our credit we did a lot of our research going in and we knew most things um what became very evident is that walter um you know, Walter had a 50-year career in front of the TV cameras and years before that on, on the stage. So he, he knew how to deflect with his charm, charisma, and 50 years of rehearsed answers, questions <laughs> that he didn't want to get into. Um, and he didn't like to dwell on the negative. That was a big yeah. thing. So we, in other parts where we were trying to push him on things that were uh, maybe not the best memories, he just wouldn't focus on that. His sexuality was something that he'd never addressed openly. It was often speculated in, uh, in Spanish language media. Um, and we certainly, I think just from a generational perspective, myself also as a queer filmmaker, wanted to kind of get Walter to say on, on camera. And I think that it was just, to a certain extent, he definitely didn't define himself, but he also came from an era and a place where one didn't talk about their sexuality. Yes. Uh, Walter would hate for us to remind people that he was 88 when he died. But, uh, you know, do you imagine sitting down with your grandmother and asking her about, uh, you know, her, what her deliances were in her teens? No, you wouldn't do that. Nope. So I think that that's part of it as well. He just, you know, it, you didn't, particularly when you were different, particularly when you identified as queer, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't have talked about that in a public way. I think, um, I think that, however, that the way he lived his life and how brazen he was in front of the camera and never really, you know, he always showed us who he was, I think is what I'm trying to say. And he did it in a time when it was still very, uh, it was groundbreaking, it was dangerous. Uh, I mean, in, you know, in the, just three years ago or two years ago during shooting in Puerto Rico, there was a, uh, a queer trap artist who was killed uh, because he was gay. And so this is present day. Imagine in the you know fifties or sixties um, coming out, uh, or let alone forties or fifties when when he was coming in uh, to age. So uh, you know we pressed him on it, uh, and he used his charisma and his charm and uh, his amazing sense of humor to deflect it. But uh, I think at the end of the day, Walter was who he was, and. That's why he's such a, a pioneer and uh, an inspiration to queer people like myself still. Yeah, that's that's something that, that really struck me is he felt so sure of himself, at least in the present. I can't imagine as he's kind of forming his personality and, and dealing with these societal constraints, you know, 50 plus years ago, if it would have been, you know, how difficult that must have been for him. But the film doesn't dwell on like negativity or prejudice that he might have experienced. You know, it talks about he kind of discovered who he was. He, you know, started performing, doing theater, and then eventually TV. Uh, were you aware of any such like incidents or issues, or maybe as you said, he just didn't really talk about it, some of the things that he had to overcome in his, in his personal and professional career? You know, Walter is very interesting because he, he, he doesn't like to talk about anything negative, anything, anything at all negative. 
it it's like a it was remarkable more than anybody I'd ever met. He wouldn't want to speak poorly of anyone like Bill in the movie. He had a very complicated relationship with his manager, and we go into that. Uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but you know he he wouldn't even say anything bad about his manager until so we really had to prompt him in some ways to to talk about these negative times or difficult things he'd gone through. But even when we talked about, you know, he, he came from the sugarcane fields of Puerto Rico and, and he would always want to frame things as though like, it was all glorious, it was all beautiful. Everything, every part of my life was beautiful. Um, although we know that's not the case. We know he went through difficult times. So, um, you, you know, it took a lot of talking him through what a documentary was. And, and actually Alex would run and go get his nieces to keep him <laughs> honest. He'd be like, Yvonne, Betty, he's lying again. <laughs> or not lying, but you know, he's, he's yeah. like, he's, he would always spin things to be positive. And when you're trying to talk about dark things, it's not, it's not easy. So, um, you know, he was a, he's a very unique person in that he can't, he does not want to, give any weight to anything that has happened in his life that's negative. Um, and it was, I don't know, it's, it's a very interesting personality trait that he had. I also think Christina and Kareem do a really nice job in the film of trying to connect the character that Walter created, that he talks about creating, to his otherness, right? And this like sense that like, in a way, the wizard that we all love was what made it, it created like a kind of uh, outward facing container for him to sort of be extra in the world, right? Like, like it always raised this question of like, is he like that because he's magic or is he like that because of his sexuality, right? And I think that Walter was very conscious of that. Um, and it allowed him to just do whatever he wanted all of the time because he could always just, as long as he never which again, as Cream said, is very like tied to the period in which he came from, you know, but like, as long as he never said it outright, people were sort of willing to kind of suspend this belief and say, you know, people who come from the dimension that Walter Mercado comes from are not confined by things like sex, right? You know, which is, you know, we know in our dimension here where we actually live, that's not the case, right? So I think there are interesting kind of connections that that these two kind of were able to draw through the edit and through some of the animation to make that clear. Well, yeah, and, and the focus on positivity throughout the film, it's not that I was looking for, you know, some darkness or negativity. I was just curious about it. One of the things that I loved about the movie is that it is so unrelentingly positive. And as we saw with the, uh, was it the History of Miami uh, exhibit that, that sort of closes out the movie, all of his adoring fans from multiple generations coming out um, and him being received. It's like this lifetime of validation all wrapped up into one kind of perfect, you know, unfortunately uh, swan song as it turned out. Um, but can you talk about uh, sort of your uh, personal need to put out positivity, uh, particularly, uh, you know, in this moment where everything in the world seems to be upside down? Yeah. Um... Sorry if you hear my my pug is snoring very loudly. So if you hear no. her, <laughs> it's not coming in. I don't want to hear anything. <laughs> um, no, I think I think yeah, these this for us working on this project has been uh, really uh, uh, has made us feel the love that Walter taught us as a kid and, and has really reminded us of these lessons that we learned very early in life that that we should treat every day um, and we should treat every person in our lives with love we should always be learning we should have hope and 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 we should work hard and all of these very basic lessons we all learned as kids and I think revisiting them now as adults for us has been a great privilege and um, you know I think we're all trying to be better people every day um, because of being around Walter um, and so it's it's I do think this, I hope the film resonates now during these times that are so, you know, filled with hatred and filled with, you know, politicians who um, uh, like to remind us how different we are from one another. I think Walter was the anti-Trump when we, he, he, you know, has, as Alex would say, he has this incredible hair. He has <laughs> like, you know, uh, this, 
this person persona, but he uses his platform for the exact opposite reason as our president. And so for, for, for us, he's an anti-Trump of sorts. He's also gender queer. He likes blending uh, like genders and, and uh, all kinds of energies. And so for us, he's like, he embodies the exact opposite of these hateful times that we live in. Yep. And, you know, I would add to that, that for us, it's also, you know, as filmmakers and as Latinos, you know, so many of the stories that we do here coming out of, uh, about the Latin American community or Latinos in the U.S. tend to deal with either, uh, you know, the border or um, uh, drug trafficking or there's so many stories that are focusing on kind of the challenges and uh, the negative aspects and it's important to remember that uh, as a people, we have our heroes, we have, uh, we have our challenges, but we also have our glories. And so in sharing Walter's story, uh, which is a mostly positive story, and, and there's moments that he's not proud of, and, and we, we go into that a bit in the film as well. But I think in, in, in sharing a positive story, uh, what we hope it reminds folks is that like everyone, uh, we have these wonderful figures in our culture that should be celebrated and should be cherished and uh, and that we've been fortunate to have for such a long time uh, so as our world becomes more and more global and connected um, it's kind of important to look at one another and and find those that can that uplift us and and share that kind of uplifting message with uh with the rest of the world definitely alex did you want to add anything uh i just think uh uh I think the only thing that I would add is that this, I tend to just think about my grandparents and our parents' generations and that this film is like a lot about legacy. You know, it's about legacy. It's about somebody um, feeling like they left uh, left something more positive in the world, you know, than, uh, than, than what they took out of it. And, and, uh, and I think that, that, hopefully this honors like the generations that came before us as much as it honors Walter. Cool. Um, two more questions. Uh, one is, and I don't want to give away spoilers either, but uh, Christina, you actually mentioned a name earlier. So hopefully people will forget, but there is a character, a person uh, in the movie uh, who is one of the great villain reveals that I've seen in any movie, regardless if it's a documentary or a piece of you know, narrative fiction. Um, it's just, it's incredible to see someone start off in a film that you think, oh, this is you know, a friend of Walter's and it turns out to be the exact you know, opposite, but also a very complicated relationship. <laughs> My question is, were you aware of, and I know you guys said you did your research and everything before getting into the film, were you aware of all of these sort of indiscretions and the, and the questions uh, bubbling up when you went in to talk to this person or did this come out sort of later? Because personally, if I had gone in there knowing half of this stuff that comes out in this movie, I don't know if I would have been able to contain myself. But I'm not a professional documentarian, so that explains it. Yeah, you, you know, um, I mean, a Alex is the true true genius who was, who, who was able to talk um, with Bill and, and, and get him to participate in the documentary. But I think, um, uh, you know, we, we wanted to tell that the story, part of Walter's story are, is the hard, the hard times. And um, we were going to talk about them one way or another. We did do our research. We had spent quite a bit of time with Walter and his family um, up until that point. Um, and so we, we wanted to, to, you know, give um, them the opportunity to respond to the criticisms that we were going to talk about anyways. And so I think, um, to Alex's credit, it was, it, we were very upfront with Bill. He knew what he was getting into. He was very honest with us. And, and the truth of the matter is, I mean, I think I've gone and spoiled everything now about the film. So uh, the spoiler alert. <laughs> Sorry. Good job, Christina. <laughs> there's there's a lot people even if they kind of know the high points they're not going to believe the details so don't right, worry right. about it okay well i appreciate that but um you, you know i think to bill's credit he answered everything that we asked him and the truth is we wouldn't know who walter is he would not have been the success that he was without the 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 work of this person and so i think um we had to talk to him and we had to interview him and we, we wanted to present it fairly. You know, we wanted to present his side of the story as well. Mm -hmm. okay. 
And I would just say that the surprising, uh, and maybe it's not surprising now in retrospect, but maybe one of the surprising things that we didn't know is that Walter still has, uh, till his dying day, a great deal of affection and appreciation for Bill. Uh, though, you know, as you'll see in the film, things got very complicated and unpleasant for a long time. Walter did not have a negative, it's just a negative thing to say about him. It's just kind of a testament to who he is as a person. Uh, he didn't want to focus on the, the bad parts, but he was more than happy to share all the wonderful times. And, uh, vice, yeah. and vice versa, I would yeah, say. Yeah, and vice versa, it's true. Well, it's, it's a lesson I think we can all <laughs> learn a lot from. Um, so in closing, I want to kind of circle back to where I began, which is, you know, he enjoyed, a, like I said, a resurgence of popularity uh, later in his life. He became, you know, a very memeable figure. And in the movie, I think one of the subjects mentions this sort of in passing, and it's a question that sort of hung there, and I couldn't let it go. So I'm glad I got to talk to you about it. Why has there not been someone to take up the mantle of Walter Mercado in an era where someone who is, you know, sexually sort of ambiguous, out and proud in a lot of ways, uh, and with the desire to entertain and just love everybody, why isn't there another Walter Mercado? Or maybe there's a thousand of them, they're just, it's the internet, so you, <laughs> no one can break through. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I, yeah, think, I, I'm sorry, I think it's, I think on the one hand, there are a lot of them, a lot more than there used to be. And we still have a lot of work to do in terms of like, you know, gender non-binary and, you know, the sort of spectrum of gender fluidity, like making these folks as visible as they should be. Um, but I will say on the other end, Walter was a very talented man. He was a very talented person. He, you know, that sort of transcends in a way or is distinct from his gender identity, his national identity, his ethnicity, all of those things. That, that stuff, those actually created kind of challenges for him, but he's so talented that he was able to incorporate them into what he did and bring that to the world. So I think the reason there hasn't been another Walter is the same reason there hasn't been another Michael Jordan, you know? Mm. Right, right. <laughs> I mean, we, we filmed with him when he was 87 years old and he is one of the sharpest people I've ever interviewed. I mean, he had an answer for everything. He was quippy, he was adorable. He would like drive the interview in the way that he wanted it to be driven. Um, and he worked really hard. I don't think that that can be understated. He was, he would go, he would film all of his horoscopes for a month in, in a day. And that tape takes a, a certain amount of mental fortitude to, to remember all of the signs. And, 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 you know, there wasn't like, we would take a lot of tape, like uh, we would use a lot of film in the documentary. And he was like, why are you wasting all of this tape? Because he came from, a, well, like with boring stuff, because he came from a time when you had to be perfect the first time. And he always was, he would, he would deliver, um, and he was the, the most professional person we'd ever worked with. So I think Alex is right. He just has like an immense talent that I'm not sure you're going to find um, nowadays. Um, but I'm sure there's another Walter out there coming. Cool. You know, I think, uh, I think Walter, uh, I think Alex said something, you know, I think there's probably a lot of other Walter like people. And I think that ultimately there's Walter's message is about love and peace. And I, eternal optimist, I really do believe that most people uh, do love and do want a peaceful world and want uh, us to love one another. So I think there's more than those and of the opposite at the end of the day. Uh, but there's just, I mean, I can't, there's just, there's only one Walter. There's only one Walter. And, uh, and that's why, uh, that's why we're so proud to be able to share his story and his legacy with everyone in our film. Well, that's beautiful, man. And, and thank you uh, for, for making the movie. Congratulations on getting it made, getting it out there. It's on Netflix uh, July 8th. Uh, everyone should watch it, whether they know Walter or have never heard of Walter Mercado. Uh, yes, thank you. Congratulations. And uh, I will end the way Walter might end it, but not with nearly as much flair. Mucho, mucho amor. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Thank you so much, Ian. Well done. Right. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Oh, sorry, I didn't do the thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Take it. care. Thank you, Ian.